Support for this podcast comes from the Neubauer Family Foundation, supporting WHYY's fresh air and its commitment to sharing ideas and encouraging meaningful conversation. This is Fresh Air. I'm Dave Davies. Terry is off this week. Tomorrow marks the one-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which sparked the largest land war in Europe since World War II. As the Russian military has struggled on the battlefield, it's become apparent that its forces have been boosted by the presence of tens of thousands of mercenary soldiers, many of them convicts recruited from Russian prisons. Our guest today, veteran forward correspondent Sean Walker, has written about the company that recruits and fields the mercenaries, the Wagner Group, and its founder, Yevgeny Prigozhin. Prigozhin has a colorful past and has built a close relationship with Russian President Vladimir Putin. In fact, he was known to many as Putin's chef. Among his many business ventures was a catering service that handled high-profile occasions for the Russian president. The Wagner Group forces have suffered high casualty rates in the war and have been accused of atrocities against civilians and summary execution of its own soldiers who desert or disobey orders. Walker reports that Prigozhin has become a wealthy man and an increasingly visible political actor within Russia, clashing publicly with Russian military leaders. Sean Walker is the Central and Eastern Europe correspondent for the British newspaper The Guardian. He reported from Russia for more than a decade and has covered the fighting in Ukraine. He's the author of the 2018 book The Long Hangover, about Russia's evolution from the collapse of the Soviet Union to its current political and economic state. Before joining The Guardian, Walker wrote for The Independent. Sean Walker, welcome to Fresh Air. Hello, great to be with you. Let's talk about Yevgeny Prigozhin. Um, he was born in 1961 in Leningrad, was a petty criminal as a young man. What kinds of things did he do? Well, we know exactly what he did from uh, some fairly extraordinary court documents from 1981, which uh, go through in, in quite a lot of detail uh, one of the crimes that he was sentenced at that time to 13 years in prison for. Uh, and it, we get this picture of Prigozhin and a group of uh, three or four young guys, his friends, who were basically carrying out these opportunistic uh, robberies, breaking and entering. Uh, one extremely sinister case that is, is laid out in these documents that they were leaving a restaurant around midnight, uh, saw a young unaccompanied woman uh, walking down the street um, and basically... Prigozhin grabbed her by the neck un until she was lost consciousness. Um, the friends uh, then took off her earrings, took her money, um, and, and ran off with this. Um, so this seems to have been, you know, just an, an ordinary day, as far as we can tell, for, for Yevgeny Prigozhin at the time. Um, him, him and his friends basically... Yeah, in, involved in, in in all kinds of in, in all kinds of street crime and and sort of petty uh, robberies and things like that. Right. So he was sentenced to thirteen years in prison, served about a decade, right, and then was released in nineteen ninety as the Soviet Union was coming to an end. What did he do when he got out? Well, that's right. So he comes out of prison. He spent his his whole twenties pretty much in jail. Uh, he emerges just before his thirtieth birthday into this uh, rapidly changing country, the very last death throes of the Soviet Union. Um, and he's able, within a few years, um, to, to kind of cement this, an, an extraordinary rise. And, you know, many people at this time uh, were making incredible transformations. It was the shock therapy. It was the introduction of capitalism. Um, there was all these opportunities. But even by those standards, uh, Prigozhin's story of, of a guy that had spent his whole 20s in jail is quite remarkable. So, you know, he comes out of prison. Um, he starts off selling hot dogs. Uh, he's mixing the mustard in his kitchen with his mother, um, going out and selling these hot dogs. But very quickly, he moves on to bigger things. Um, he, he falls in with some new uh, business partners. He ends up with shares in some supermarkets. Um, and, and by the middle of the 1990s, um, he's got a new project, which is opening up uh, a restaurant, uh, which is quite a new concept, a uh, fine dining restaurant in, in Russia of the 90s. There, there are not many places in St. Petersburg where 
you can go and eat nice food. And to start with this place, it's called the Old Customs House. Uh, and to start with, it's a bit of a seedy establishment. Um, it has strippers to, to, to kind of entice in clientele. Um, but before long, it gets a reputation as, as really being one of the best places to eat in the city. Uh, and so the, the business elite, uh, the political elite, all kinds of people come to Prigozhin's restaurant to eat. And among them uh, is the mayor of St. Petersburg, uh, uh, Anatoly Sobchak. And on occasion, he brings with him his deputy mayor, uh, which is a guy called Vladimir Putin. Uh, and that's the first time that, that Putin and Prigozhin uh, come into contact well before uh, Putin has become uh, a big major political figure. Right. So, you know, Putin's rise uh, in the Russian political world is, is well documented. Prigozhin would eventually get some big government contracts. Did that come from his relationship with Putin? What were they? There's this period uh, between the first time when Prigozhin and Putin meet back then in the 90s um, in St. Petersburg. And to start with, even, even in the, 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 those first years, there was not really any sign of, of this extraordinary rise um, to prominence that we would see later from Prigozhin. He starts off basically as a kind of reliable uh, restaurateur. So you know, Putin remembers him. Uh, he invites him and his catering company uh, to start catering for some quite big government events. But really, this is this is this is catering work. I mean, Prigozhin is is there. He's serving the wine himself. Uh, he's he's kind of handing out the plates. You can you can see actually in in pictures, photographs from the early years of Putin's presidency. Uh, you can see kind of Prigozhin often lurking in the background. You would never have spotted him if if you weren't looking for him. He's there. Um, you know, hiding away when Putin is dining with George W. Bush quite early on in his presidency. You can see him in the background when Putin is hosting Prince Charles in St. Petersburg. Um, and really, there's no sign at this point that this guy is anything other than um, uh, a caterer. Um, but somehow, in these interactions, uh, Prigozhin manages to, to catch Putin's attention. He manages to, to sort of show himself as a reliable guy, really, who can uh, be on hand to serve, as the way that Prigozhin put it in one of the few interviews he's given, is that Putin saw that I wasn't above bringing the plates myself. And something in this, uh, and, and clearly something also in Prigozhin's personal ability to kind of uh, ingratiate himself with superiors um, leads to a situation where he starts to win contracts that are much bigger than simply um, catering for, for for dinners for government functions. Uh, he starts to win these huge government contracts, catering for schools, catering for the army, um, and then from these army contracts, it metastases further. Um, and in 2014, when Putin takes the decision to annex Crimea and invade Ukraine for the first time, uh, and the Kremlin is sort of looking for, for ways to disguise the fact that its troops are active in Ukraine, um, Prigozhin steps in again. And, and this time, he offers to set up a kind of private military uh, company, which will be able to do the Kremlin's work for it, but retain that kind of deniability. Uh, and then that moment, I think, is really the beginning of the Prigozhin we have today um, as the kind of warlord. Um, and, and that's really the stepping stone from this, this first career in, in restaurants and in serving plates of food to dignitaries uh, to this extraordinary figure that we see today. You mentioned earlier his uh, language and general vibe. Just tell us what he looked like and how he came off to people. Well, you know, if you look at him now today, um, he is, uh, you know, he's a big guy. He's got a shaven head. He speaks in kind of quite coarse language. Um, and, and, you know, it's clear that this is not a polished guy. This is not... 
a particularly well-educated or cultured guy, you would think, when you hear him speak. And indeed, in the past year when Prigozhin has been flying around the prisons of Russia and basically pitching inmates that uh, if you come and fight for me in Ukraine, I'll give you your freedom. And we spoke when we were, me and my colleague, when we were researching this article, we managed to get hold of uh, a few prisoners um, who are still in prison um, and speak with them either by uh, text message or in other ways um, and ask them sort of how they, you know, how they saw this guy, what, why, why people agreed to go, why in their case they didn't agree to go. And they all said to us, like, you know, we could see from this guy that he was one of us. We kind of respected him because he'd also been in prison. He had that this whole, uh, there's a word in Russian, uh, zek, which means kind of convict or inmate. Um, and, and they all said, you know, you could see that he was a former zek, the way he talked, the way he kind of gave his word that if they fought for him, he would give them their freedom. Um, all of these people said, you know, we wouldn't trust a normal Russian official, um, but this guy had something about him that made us think he was one of us. And the interesting thing about that is that people who are, you know, career criminals are suspicious of other people, uh, right? I mean, even one of their own. He must have had some ability to, he must have been a great communicator to connect with them and sell what he was selling. Yeah, I think he has, uh, in his own way, he has a certain amount of charisma. And I think there's also a kind of, you know, slightly aggressive, slightly distasteful, but but a straight-talking way about the way he speaks. So there was actually, I think it was probably released by his people as, as part of his recent kind of PR drive, but there was a two-minute clip of uh, Prigozhin walking into one of these prisons, assembling all of the inmates in, uh, in the courtyard of the prison and basically telling them, uh, as I was just saying, you know, basically saying to them, come and fight for me and we'll give you your freedom. Um, and what you see is that he's not sugarcoating this at all. Uh, he's not pretending that this is going to be pleasant or this is going to be a holiday. Um, he's basically saying that you're probably going to die. It's going to be absolutely horrible. Um, the fighting is incredibly intense. We're going to throw you right in at the front line. But if you survive this, you know, I will, I've got your back. I will make sure you're given your freedom. I will give you um, everything you need to sort of get back going in, 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 in normal life. And, you know, some of these people were people who still had 10, 15, 20 years to serve of their sentences. Some of them were convicted for multiple murders. Um, so I think, you know, in, in this strange way, the fact that he was so open that, um, you know, this is going to be horrible, but at the end of it, I have the power to let you go, um, was in a, in a weird way kind of, it was a kind of straight talking that these prisoners respected. So Prigozhin first takes on this role of, of developing a private army in service of Vladimir Putin in 2014 when there was this Russian incursion into Ukraine, which was disguised, right? They, it wasn't, Russians weren't openly declaring their own military to be involved. So it was helpful for Putin to have Prigozhin develop this private military force. Did Prigozhin and the Wagner Group get assistance from the Russian military also? Yes, absolutely. So I think we can't really look at Wagner and Prigozhin out of the context of, of the Kremlin and the Russian military, even though, I mean, for a long time, Prigozhin denied having anything to do with Wagner or even knowing what it was. And you know, later then suggested that it's, it's you know, this independent fighting force. Vladimir Putin many times said that, you know, whatever Prigozhin is, whatever Wagner is, it, it has nothing to do with the Russian state. Um, this, of course, is, is, is fully untrue. Um, and the people in the defense ministry, they don't really like Prigozhin. They don't like his manner. He doesn't have an army background. He's, as we've said, he's very coarse. But in case they have any doubt that they have to basically do what he's saying, uh, he says to them uh, in the recollections of one person that we spoke to, um, these orders come directly from Papa. 
And th this was remembered in the defense ministry because nobody else there calls Putin Papa. They call him chief or number one or something like that. Um, but here was this guy who, who speaks about Papa. And that, and, and that was clearly meant as a way to sort of demonstrate that he has this separate relationship with Putin that's very close, um, almost filial, and that basically these guys have to do what he says because he's getting his orders um, directly from Putin. So he gets his mercenary force going. They are active in Ukraine, but then they're doing other things too. They also intervened in Syria where Russia played a role on behalf of the Assad regime. Um, what did they do? How were they regarded? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think the, the Russian decision to, to intervene in, in Syria is, a, is another one of these really key milestones for the rise of Prigozhin, um, because in Syria, um, Prigozhin is really everywhere. I mean, he is again winning all those contracts and for, for, for catering, for logistics and so on. Um, but the Wagner Group is also sent out there um, and his mercenaries, do quite a lot of, of the fighting in this intervention. Um, it's not a very smooth relationship. Again, the, the, the military, um, they're not big fans of Wagner, they're not big fans of Prigozhin, but because Prigozhin is sort of, has this direct line to Putin, um, and because he does have, you know, good fighters who are willing to go in and, and really do aggressive stuff on the front lines, um, they're kind of forced to integrate um, uh, integrate these these troops, um, and and this really just it, the Syria experience kind of adds um, to Prigozhin's clout. You note that uh, Prigozhin and the Wagner Group's activities in all of these theaters drew the attention of journalists and opposition figures too, like Alexei Navalny. It can be dangerous in Russia to ask sensitive questions of the wrong people. Did they suffer consequences for, for these investigations? Well, yes, it certainly can be dangerous in, in Russia. There are a, a number of people who it can be particularly dangerous to start asking questions about. Um, one of them, for example, the, the leader of Chechnya, Ramzan Kadyrov, uh, people who look into his deeds and affairs often seem to have terrible things happen to them um, soon afterwards. Uh, and another one uh, who I would put right up the top there is, is Yevgeny Prigozhin. Um, for a long time, um, he's been both extremely litigious, um, sort of going after uh, anyone who suggests he's done anything wrong or even anyone suggest, who suggested that he in fact was behind the Wagner Group uh, until very recently he was suing people for suggesting that. Um, and then when he came out last year and said, actually, I've, I've been running it since 2014, um, his explanation for why he sort of sued everyone who said that previously was that um, in every issue there should be room for sport. Um, but as, as well as the legal side of things, um, certainly people who look into Prigozhin's activities um, tend to have um, rather worrying, sinister things happen to them soon after. Uh, one of the journalists who, who did one of the biggest investigations into Prigozhin um, had a severed ram's head uh, delivered to his newsroom and a funeral wreath delivered to his home address. Uh, so it's kind of really a bit of a, bit of a sort of mafia touch. Um, and you mentioned Alexei Navalny. So, um, yeah, his team did a series of investigations into Prigozhin and into how he was winning these government contracts back in 2015, 2016. Um, and the, the, the main investigator on, on, on these was uh, a woman called Lubov Sobol, um, who is one of Navalny's top aides. And not long after one of these investigations came out, um, sh her husband was just arriving home to their apartment when um, a, a sort of unknown assailant appeared, stabbed him in the leg with a syringe uh, and ran off. Uh, and he then collapsed. Um, I was talking to, to Lubov about this uh, recently when we were uh, preparing this article about Prigozhin. 
Now, she was convinced that, of course, this attack was linked to her investigation. Um, they managed to rush her husband to hospital. Um, he got very quick medical attention. Uh, she said that the doctors told her that if it had been a bit longer, he may not, he may not have survived. It was a, a very strong um, animal tranquilizer that had been injected into his leg. And so, yeah, there are these um, kind of story after story of kind of quite unpleasant things happening to journalists. So, yeah, some, some pretty sinister things can happen to you if, if you cross Yevgeny Prigozhin. Let's put it that way. We need to take another break here. Well, let me reintroduce you. We are speaking with Sean Walker. He is a foreign correspondent for The Guardian and author of the 2018 book, The Long Hangover. He'll be back to talk more after a short break. I'm Dave Davies, and this is Fresh Air. Our guest, Sean Walker, is a foreign correspondent for the British newspaper The Guardian, who's reported extensively from Russia and has covered the war in Ukraine. He's written recently about Yevgeny Prigozhin, whose company, the Wagner Group, has recruited tens of thousands of mercenary soldiers to fight for Russia in Ukraine, many of them from Russian prisons. Prigozhin has become close to Vladimir Putin and is now a wealthy man with an increasingly visible political presence in Russia. So let's talk about Evgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner Group and what they were up to in Ukraine. I mean, you've talked about how he would personally go to Russian prisons and recruit people, tell them this is going to be rough, you may not survive, but if you are out, um, you will get a full pardon. Uh, was there a, a, a time limit to how long they had to last? And, and did he tell them, I don't know, how, how bad, how hard it was going to be? Yeah, so the, the basic pitch that he has been giving to Russian prisoners was six months. Uh, so, you know, even if you've got 20 years left on your sentence, uh, if you come with me in six months, you will be free. Now, rights advocates, lawyers say they have no idea on what basis he's able to make this offer. There's nothing in the Russian legal code and there's been no amendments to suggest that it's possible to simply take people out of prisons and pardon them. But the first set of people have already uh, done their six months and some of them have been freed. So it's clear that Prigozhin has the authority to do this. Um, but yes, the, the basic pitch is six months. It's going to be... Um, horrible. It's going to be very difficult. If you try to run away, we'll shoot you. If you don't give you everything, we will shoot you. There is no space for time wasters, for cowards. But you go to the front, you put in your service, you may die. If you don't, after six months, you're free to go. That's the pitch. Wow, it's like something out of a bad movie. Um, you know, it's it, the legal side of this is interesting. I mean, a private individual doesn't really, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like they're going to court where these people were sentenced and before whom victims might come and say, not so fast, you know, what are you, you this, this person, uh, you know, committed a terrible offense. It's this extra legal thing. And then there's also the fact that, as I understand it, mercenaries are actually illegal in Russia, right? Yeah, I mean, all of this is is just the shakiest, most absurd uh, legal territory imaginable. And and indeed, what you mentioned about victims, I mean, there have been one or two specific stories by some of the brave Russian journalists who are, who are still in Russia of, you know, people finding out that the guy who, in one example, murdered and set on fire their family and was sentenced basically to life in prison for multiple murders, has now done his six months at the front and is free. Yeah, I was going to ask you about these reports of, you know, um, convicts who served their time, were released and then returned, you know, in some cases to small towns or villages where they would be among their victims. Do we know anything more about What's been the, you know, the fallout from that, whether there have been subsequent crimes or anything? So I'm not sure that, that you know, there's been anyone who has been able to do systematic enough research to, to understand whether there have been um, follow up crimes. I mean, I think what I would say um, is something that um, the the sort of political analyst and thinker Ivan Krastev uh, said to me. Um, which I found interesting about this, which is the idea that what Prigozhin is trying to do is, is really redefine 
who makes up Russian society and the Russian nation. Um, and he made the point that, you know, there are more Russians who have a relative or somebody close to them in prison uh, than there are Russians who regularly travel abroad. Uh, and you know, Russia, I think, after the United States, has the highest level of incarceration uh, in the world. Uh, and so what part of Prigozhin's pitch, really, is that you know, patriotic, real Russia is not the guys that go to Paris for the weekend. It's not the cosmopolitan elites. Um, it's these prisoners. And if you want to get Freudian about it, I mean, you know, of course, he spent his 20s in prison himself. So there is part of this, I think, um, that is about, you know, this guy saying to these people, even convicted of horrific crimes, you know, you do your time at the front and you will get redemption and you will be released back into society and you will become part of society. And I guess in, in certain constituencies in Russia, that's something people find horrifying. And in other constituencies, it's something people find perhaps quite appealing. Well, you know, and, and war veterans are often honored uh, if they're returning as criminals, but also heroes. That's kind of odd. Um, <laughs> I mean, I guess the other question that would occur is if they were plucked from prison by someone who had this extra legal authority to grant a, a pardon, could that same person give them protection from future crimes? I mean— Right, <laughs> I mean, if you if you get into trouble, you call Prigozhin, and he's got the kind of connections that can get you off. Yeah, and we've certainly seen uh, a little bit of that. I mean, it remains to be seen exactly how all of this plays out, and I think perhaps a lot will depend on on what happens to Prigozhin himself in the coming months. Um, but certainly, he's he has been making this pitch that okay, these guys. Um, they have, they should be absolved of whatever sins they had committed by this service at the front, and on their return, they should be given every help to reintegrate into into life, uh, into ordinary life. So we, we we've seen him release videos of him sort of having these fireside chats with with people who have come back from the front, and him saying, you know, here here is this, here is your sort of card to freedom, you know, there's a phone number here, call it if you run into any problems. We've heard him suggest that Russia's top universities should uh, should find spaces for free for scholarships for, for these uh, former prisoners who return from the front. We've even heard one politician say, well, we should, we should create um, some, some seats in the Duma, the Russian parliament, uh, and we should have MPs who are these former prisoners um, who have come back from the front. Uh, I'm not sure how much of this will actually happen, um, but it's certainly um, yeah, emblematic of, of this idea that um, Prigozhin kind of wants to redefine um, who are the real Russians and to, to kind of, uh, while on the one hand, yeah, many of these people are used as cannon fodder, but those who survive should be respected and, and, and kind of given a new status. I'm going to take a break here. Let me in reintroduce you. We are speaking with Sean Walker. He's a foreign correspondent for The Guardian. We'll continue our conversation in just a moment. This is Fresh Air. The following message comes from NPR sponsor Sattva. Founder and CEO Ron Rudson is on a mission to bring quality sleep to more people. Health and wellness are so tied to quality sleep. And I'm trying to tell everyone, look, you have to treat sleep like an activity. Because I believe sleep is the most important thing in your life. To learn more, go to SAATVA.com slash NPR. This is Fresh Air, and our guest is Sean Walker, a foreign correspondent for the British newspaper The Guardian. He has written recently about Yevgeny Prigozhin, whose company, the Wagner Group, has recruited tens of thousands of mercenary soldiers to fight for Russia in Ukraine, many of them from Russian prisons. So I want to talk about the, the role of the Wagner Group and their, their soldiers in the fighting in Ukraine. You know, convicts are, you know, presumably tough guys and people not afraid of a physical confrontation. There's a little difference between that and being a trained soldier. I mean, how much training do they get before they go into combat? Um, extremely little, uh, I think, is the answer to that. Uh, perhaps a couple of weeks. Um, all of the reports we've had of, of the way that... Um, the convicts are used uh, by the Wagner group is that, you know, they're not used on 
on uh, sort of difficult strategic operations or um, yeah, or, or anything particularly um, targeted and careful. Um, they're really used as cannon fodder and talking to Ukrainians who have been on the other side of the lines and, and kind of watched the Wagner troops um, approach them. Um, they've said the same thing that it's, it, you know, it's really um, kind of strength in numbers. Um, it's a, a, a bit of a disregard really for, for human life. Um, and for those who have not fancied it and have decided that they want to either defect or don't want to advance. Um, we've had numerous credible reports that there's been executions of their own people um, as kind of punishment for disobeying orders and to keep everybody else in line and to keep them sort of, you know, forcing them to, to sort of surge forward in these pretty grim, almost suicidal movements forward. Yeah, there's a famous video of one soldier who... Um who defected to the Ukrainian side and then got sent back in a prisoner exchange. You want to just tell us about that? Yeah, so this was a, a chap called Yevgeny Nuzhin. He surfaced when some Ukrainian journalists interviewed him in Ukrainian captivity. And he basically told his story, which was that he was a prisoner in Russia. He was recruited by Prigozhin to fight at the front. He arrived at the front line, started reading about the war, decided that he didn't want to be part of this. And simply walked across the front lines and surrendered to the Ukrainians. Now, somehow, sometime after that, he was swapped back in a prisoner exchange and arrived back in Russia. And the next thing we heard from him was this really horrific video where he basically says who he is, and then we can see how he is murdered with a sledgehammer, basically, to, to his head um, as... A, essentially as a warning, I think, to other Wagner troops that uh, this is, you know, even if you defect, there's going to be no safety for you in Ukraine. We will get you and we will kill you. And this video, was it, I mean, do we know, was it released by the Wagner group or by Prigozhin's people? I mean, was the intent to, to send a message? Um, we have to assume that it was. When, when Prigozhin was asked about it, he didn't directly say, oh, yes, this was me. But he sort of joked about it. He said it was a great show. Um, and, you know, this is the way Prigozhin communicates this kind of really ugly, dark humor. He's never directly admits to something, but will sort of, you know, give you a wink and suggest that this guy got what was coming to him. So I think the most likely explanation is, yes, indeed, like they went to a great effort to get this guy back and then performed this horrific extrajudicial execution um, as a warning to others who, who might be thinking of the same thing. Um, and we also have a lot of evidence that, um, you know, simply out in the field, uh, if people disobey orders, they will just be taken to one side and executed. We, we spoke to one former Wagner commander who said he'd personally seen several executions in the field um, of people who were trying to disobey orders. Yeah, you know, um, um, there was a story in the New York Times which estimated that about 40,000 inmates would have joined the Russian forces, which, if so, would have been roughly 10% of the country's prison population. Do those numbers sound about right to you? Yeah, that does sound about right. And I mean, it, it's an extraordinary number of people. And it's, it's, you know, it's one of the many things about this war that, I mean, if you... <laughs> If you had suggested that this would happen a year ago, I mean, it's just so out of the realms of, of, of fantasy that this former convict is going to fly around prisons in his helicopter and offer people salvation for fighting for him at the front and then lead this, these battalions of prisoners in to, all, to their almost certain deaths. I mean, it's, it's, it's so extraordinary. It's so extrajudicial. Um, it's so dystopian um, that it's really hard to believe. But, but yeah, it, ha it has happened. Prigozhin has claimed that they have had more success than the Russian military, that they captured the, the town of Soledar, if I'm saying that right, and have made progress in other areas. Are they right? Well, it's certainly true that, you know, since, since last spring, successes for the Russian army in Ukraine have not been very frequent. You know, the invasion didn't go as Putin had planned. 
the withdrawal from the outskirts of Kiev at, at the end of last March was a disaster. Um, and, and since then, um, you know, the Russians have very little to show for for this kind of bloody, painful and, and, and ongoing mess. So, yeah, w- when Wagner troops um, took over this small town of Solidar um, late last year, um, that was indeed the, the, the first Russian military success for some time. Um, at the same time, it's clear that they took enormous casualties doing so. So, yeah, I mean, Wagner certainly had more success than the Russian army, but the losses it sustained in doing so were so major that uh, I think many have questioned whether that's really going to be sustainable as a, as a long-term um, way of fighting. I'm going to take a break here. Let me in- reintroduce you. We are speaking with Sean Walker. He's a foreign correspondent for The Guardian. We'll continue our conversation in just a moment. This is Fresh Air. You know, Prigozhin, after for years denying he was even connected to the Wagner Group, which which fields these mercenaries, now embraces it, brags about it, and he has has publicly castigated leading members of the Russian military, accusing them of treason and saying that they failed to provide him with necessary supplies, etc. Um, what has been their reaction to this? How's it affected his standing in the war effort? Do we know? Well, it's been a really interesting dynamic to observe because, as you say, some of the things that Prigozhin has said about the Russian army leadership, if any ordinary Russian posted a status on Facebook saying such things or um, allowed themselves to say such things publicly, the next day they'd have the police at their apartment door and they would be arrested and they'd probably spend several years in prison. So... You know, it's, it's, it's really quite extraordinary um, in the middle of this war effort that you have <laughs> this sort of rogue warlord who is, who is publicly insulting um, the, the top military brass. And, you know, I think certainly we know that even back in 2014, the top generals didn't really like Prigozhin. Um, and absolutely, um, they will be furious by his outbursts um, and his insults right now. Uh, Of course, you know, the arbiter in in all of this is Putin. And what we haven't really seen, um, except for very, very vaguely, we haven't seen the army kind of publicly pushing back against Prigozhin and and taking this feud uh, into the public domain. They've just basically had to swallow and... uh, and, and deal with it. Um, but you can be certain that kind of behind closed doors, um, they will be taking their concerns about Prigozhin to Putin um, and trying to sort of bring this guy down to size. You've talked about Prigozhin's style, his crude and in-your-face persona. And a couple of things that I read just are really stunning. One of them that he challenged Volodymyr Zelensky, the the Ukrainian president, to a duel when he was in the cockpit of a bomber, apparently. And then in another statement, threatened to urinate in in the face of one of his critics, who was a former Russian commander and a blogger. Uh, I I, I assume you've heard these things. I mean, does that kind of vulgar stuff help him? I don't know. What do you make of that? I mean, I think he's enjoying himself in his own weird and twisted way. I think, you know, until a year ago, he wasn't a public figure. He never gave interviews. He never really appeared in public. um, And he shunned all publicity. The invasion of Ukraine has totally changed that because, you know, Wagner no longer needs to be secret. Wagner is openly part of the war effort. And he sort of, first of all, slowly came out into the public eye And then it soon quickly became apparent that he enjoys this. He enjoys um, he enjoys being in 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 the spotlight. Um, He enjoys these public feuds. Uh, And, you know, every day he is press services releasing a new statement from him in response to questions from journalists. He rarely answers the question, but he will normally use that crude humor that you mentioned to make some kind of terrible joke about the questions that he's been asked. Um, But it's very clear that he is kind of relishing um, being a public figure now. You've written that 
as his profile has increased, he's presented, he's pushed this idea that, you know, the Russians that we should really admire are not rich people who fly to London and buy apartments in the West, but ordinary Russians who have made mistakes, who may have gone to prisons, but who have sacrificed and been true patriots. They've been willing to go and fight for their country. These sound like the kinds of things that a populist, uh, an, an aspiring populist politician would say. Is he believed to have political ambitions? And the obvious question here is, will Putin regard him as a threat? This is one of the big questions in, in Russian politics in as, in as much as Russian politics exists uh, right now. Um, you know, what, what is the ceiling? Uh, what is Prigozhin's ceiling? Um, and, and is there a chance that, you know, up, up to now, he, we've seen him uh, be absolutely ruthless about generals, about politicians, about pretty much anyone but slavishly loyal to Putin. He's kind of the anti-elite Putinist. Um, uh, he never has said a word critical of Putin. Um, and of course, Putin has been his benefactor for this whole journey. Um, you know, is there, a, is there a moment when he could suddenly turn against Putin? I mean, you know, history is full of those examples and, and it's, it's not impossible. Um, but I think so far, what we see is that he is still somebody that is very reliant um, on Putin's favor. Um, and we don't see a sign of him kind of trying to push against uh, the Kremlin. Um, we, we see him trying to work within um, the sphere he's been given by Putin and, and kind of maximize his, his potential in that way. Um, you know, it's a it's a big question where Prigozhin will be in a year, but uh, it's also a big question whether he will even still be alive in a year. Um, one of the ways that Russia and the Kremlin has traditionally dealt with uh, its proxies in eastern Ukraine, who became a little bit inconvenient or a little bit too outspoken, um, and this happened on several occasions, was that they would simply die in an explosion or a car bomb, and the Kremlin would say, oh, they've been targeted by Ukrainian uh, diversionary groups. What a tragedy. Um, but, you know, it was fairly clear that this was, these were people who were being taken out by their own side. Uh, I don't think that's um, an incredibly unlikely outcome for Prigozhin because he is angering so many people uh, in the Russian elite. Um, but, you know, equally, so far, we've seen him just rise and rise and rise. Um, and, and who's to say where his ceiling is and, and, and where that stops? Huh, interesting. Yeah, a man from a dangerous world playing a dangerous game. Um, you know, on the military side, there's been reporting that, that Prigozhin is no longer able to recruit in the prisons. I think there was some reporting that the Russian military itself might be recruiting in the prisons. Um, do we know what this means? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly a sense that uh, sort of after that initial flurry of recruitment where tens of thousands of prisoners were were sent off to the to the front under Prigozhin's command I mean that's not uh, an inexhaustible resource um, and it, it seems that that sort of his his recruitment is is over as you say there have been as you say some reports that the regular army is now recruiting in prisons but I think we're not talking about anything like the same numbers. Um, as we were seeing in in the Wagner Drive, but I think as as the war kind of heads into its second year, it's very unclear how Prigozhin and Wagner will will fit into this now. You know, is he basically a busted flush? He's used his troops for some small gains. He's taken enormous losses. He's burned all his relationships with the defense ministry, and essentially he's going to be quietly maneuvered out of the way, perhaps suffer, quote unquote, an unfortunate accident? Or are we going to see what we've seen with Evgeny Prigozhin all along his career, which is that, you know, against the odds, he somehow comes out even stronger um, than he was before? Well, Sean Walker, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for having me. Sean Walker is a foreign correspondent for The Guardian and author of the book, The Long Hangover. Fresh Air's executive producer is Danny Miller. Our technical director and engineer is Audrey Bentham. 
Our interviews and reviews are produced and edited by Amy Sallett, Phyllis Myers, Roberta Shorrock, Sam Brigger, Lauren Krenzel, Teresa Madden, Anne-Marie Baldonado, Seth Kelly, Susan Yakundi, and Joel Wolfram. Our digital media producer is Molly C.V. Nesper. Thea Challoner directed today's show. For Terry Gross, I'm Dave Davies. 